Alright, what's going on you guys? It's your boy 3 Stickity Stacks in this thing, baby, representing TKOG. Yo, so like, this deck right here, man, this is one of the funnest decks I've ever played. It's honestly like one of the coolest decks I've ever played, and I've always enjoyed it. Uh, and I really think this deck has always had potential. Uh, it's just one of my favorite decks right now. Um, I think that uh, this deck definitely, uh, like, it is very matchup specific sometimes, just in the terms of attributes that are required. So it does kind of have a play style that to a certain extent does rely on what your opponent has access to. Um, but outside of just that one weakness that it shares in matchups, when this deck gets its setup, when this deck gets its engine going, when this deck gets access to its R-type specific cards, it has a snowballing factor. It has a, a, like a super aggressive control element where like it plays like a control deck, but also like OTK is like a glass cannon deck, if that makes sense. Uh, it's a very, very skillful deck. It has main deck archetype specific outs to problematic cards. Uh, you can get your normal summons up to 35, 4,000 attack, uh, which is just ridiculous. Uh, the fact that like this deck literally doesn't even need Boral Sword or Axis Code uh, to go for game. It's very interactive versus proactive. There are some decks that have pro uh, proactive aspect, uh, comparing it to like, for example, um, True King of All Calamities or uh, Lingering Effects like Lancia or Drone Lockbird or Dweller that are telling you for the rest of this turn, like, you can't do this A, B, or C, or D. Floodgates. Herald of Perfection is kind of reactive, too. Uh, so when I say that, compare it to this deck, because this deck doesn't actually stop you from playing Yu-Gi-Oh! It's just a very interactive deck. It actually stimulates and promotes healthy, uh, what I feel like is actually healthy interactions. Uh, so when you're playing against this deck and you lose to it, it's actually just because you got out-resourced and your opponent just outskilled you, like they outplayed you. It's not because the deck's just so broken. It's not because the deck's just so unfair. And that's what I love about this deck is that you don't really need to play broken cards to win. The deck's just that good by itself that you don't need like some inherent win condition, like some blowout card. Like The deck is just really good by itself. Uh, having consistent interruptions to your hand traps, your plunder patrols, uh, being able to resource, like basically manage your resources and out-resource your opponent, uh, being able to come back out of nowhere, having consistent follow-ups, and generating advantage on your turn and your opponent's turn. There's a lot of good things about this deck, and I feel like the weaknesses are easily mitigated. Uh, just by when you know what your weakest matchups are, you kind of either side deck or main deck just to counter what your weakest matchups. And the weakest matchups this deck has are going to be Virtual Worlds, and then also, I feel personally, Zodiac. Some of its best matchups, in my opinion, are definitely um, like Dogmatica Invoked. Um, I feel like Eldritch. Um, Prank Hits, to a certain extent. Uh, I feel like its worst matchups, honestly, are just going to probably be, yeah, like uh, Zodiacs and Virtual Worlds. Like Drytron, to an extent, my main deck does have outs to the like, win condition. It's really just any deck that doesn't give you the attributes that you need to play Yu-Gi-Oh! But anyways, I feel like I've talked enough. I'm sure some people are already upset at the simple fact that I talk so much about this deck. Uh, but I do like the deck a lot, so let's go ahead and get into my list. Um, so, we're going to start off with the Plunder Patrols themselves, starting off with three copies of Whitebeard, uh, three copies of Redbeard, I play three blue, and also three golden hair. Uh, these are like just, like in my opinion, like I, I played Extenders, like Silent Angler. Those cards are more for like more fair formats, or I guess you could say, if we're like in a combo heavy format, where like their decks, the decks are like actually like Pendulum. Or they're like uh, Dragon Link, not Dragon Link with the Buster Lock, but post um, them like ever using Union Carrier. Where they're just setting up boards full of negates. I feel like extenders are more valuable than hand traps because hand traps are to prevent the board from happening, and extenders are to help you to break the board when it does happen. And I would always put my like I, if I had to gamble, I would always gamble on using my R type specific card that breaking a board versus like playing the risk of one for one trade offs with hand traps. If that makes sense, we're in a format now where like. Yes, you do need hand traps against certain decks, and some decks you actually need back row removal, which is kind of important. And then other decks, like, you need access to booty. So, you know, this deck does face a lot of problems um, pre-side decking. You know, when you side deck, obviously your side deck is going to help to benefit and supplement all your weaknesses. Um, but outside of that, I feel like there's no real, um, like, extenders that you need in this R-Type right now that are going to solve any problems for you uh, for your problematic matchups. Like... I just, Silent Angler is good. I really like uh, Genix Undyne. I like the, um, you know, the Tinny, uh, the Tinny Water Monsters, Tana. But for me right now, these are the only monsters outside of Hand Traps that I feel like you should be playing. Uh, these cards are just all crazy. White Beard, Red Beard, Blue, and also Golden are just all really, really, really powerful cards. Uh, all of them have multiple effects. These are what help you to play around cards like Winda. Uh, these also, uh, without Chuchi access, Chuchi is a different story. 
But if they didn't call water, funny enough, Whitebeard helps you to play around Chuchi and VFD. Because uh, if they Chuchi pop this, but they didn't call water, which if they didn't call water, his effect in Grave can activate to summon a Redbeard. And then on your opponent's draw phase, you can attempt to activate this. And even if they pop it, it will summon. It just won't get the equip. So you'll still get the ship out. Uh, which is pretty cool, you know, so just keep that in mind. Like, it does help you to play around VFD to an extent. Uh, it's very similar to how Zodiac can summon a Dryden and kind of just pass. So, like, if you're up against VFD alone and there's no Chuchi, uh, you can rest assured with just Redbeard and Whitebeard just being able to tag out into a ship on your opponent's turn, uh, which is really cool. It, it gives you something which is better than nothing. Golden Hair is really, really nuts in this deck, to be honest. She's the best follow-up, and once you get access to her, you don't really need a second one. Uh, you just keep grinding it out every single turn, getting her back from grave. Uh, Bluebeard is crazy too. It's in, these are all extenders, um, except for like Redbeard. Redbeard solves problems on his own. Uh, next up, I'm gonna talk about kind of like the gas, the um, the engine cards. We have three copies of Shipyard, one Optimus Prime, giving me four. I also play a uh, triple Pot of Desires. Draw two is really nice in this deck. You play three of like every Plunder Patrol card that I'm main decking. I play three of. Uh, I'm also playing three copies of Fusion. I like Fusion. I think it's really busted. It's also really important in a format where your matchups, like any Plunder Patrol player kind of understands where I'm coming from, where like you do actually rely on your opponent. So yeah, it's like a drawback of this deck, but it's okay. I still like this deck a lot. I think this deck is really, really strong. Uh, and because of that, I think it's really important to max out on Fusion so that you can summon a least when you want to versus relying on Booty. Like if you're up against Zodiac, it's really, really hard. Like for one, they're always going to pop Booty with Dryden. So like you need to be able to like have access to multiple booties, but a smart player will wait for you to use this effect and then change right in anyway. So it's just like such an uphill battle. Uh, so like you need cards like this to be able to kind of cheat out your resources. Another way you can do it is with uh, Emblem. And when we get to my extra deck, you'll see that I play targets so that whenever I have access to Emblem, then I have a decent hand that can put multiple bodies onto the field. I essentially can get access to either Lee's, Moark, or even Brawn, depending on the situation. I feel like Brawn is really not that great. Like, it's Brawn is not as good as Mork against Eldritch. I know a lot of people feel like Brawn's just crazy against the deck. But I feel like banishing Golden Lords is more important than banishing their Elixirs and their Golden Lands. Because without Golden Lord, that deck just doesn't really do anything. Uh, Brawn is better against, like, other back row decks, other control decks that, like, actually rely on their traps. So you can trade one-for-ones with them. But when you trade one-for-one, you get a search in the process. So your opponent goes neg one while you go plus one. Because you're taking a resource from them and giving yourself one. And you still have the body on field. So Brawn is okay, but I feel like Mork is definitely better. So, like, whenever you're playing against Eldritch, you definitely always want to summon out Mork. And uh, that's why I started playing IP Masquerina in my extra deck. So that whenever I needed a dark, I didn't have to rely on my hand traps or like an RNG factor or relying on booty, not getting popped, uh, which is why I really like maxing out on emblem and shipping because these are some of the only ways that you can actually get access to the ships you want without relying on your opponent controlling the attributes that you need. Uh, and then I also max out on booty. These are all like my plunder cards. Uh, basically, like these are all consistency cards. This is not, but this is a huge problem solving card. Booty so important in this format. I just can't see myself playing any less than three uh, to be honest like you sometimes live and die by this depending on the matchup like if you're up against drytrons or let's say you're playing against eldritch or you know let's like let's say you're just playing against i don't know shit alls or dogmatica invoked those decks are amazing for you they have like so many attributes that you can use and it's very easy for this deck to play through cards like macabre this deck can out window without even committing really anything except the normal summon you know this deck is really really good to be honest it is, uh, but the matchups where like they don't give you the attributes that you want, even if let's say they have access to fire, but you need more, or you need you know you need access to lease, or you want bluebeard because you need to get more resources back. Uh, this is why this card's so important. Like I just can't play any less than three right now. Um, and outside of that, I just have my hand traps and my defensive card, and this is where the deck building process does differentiate based on the mindsets and also your personal experience. Uh, you could build to beat locals. I kind of build to just beat what's popular. Uh, so I played three Ash Blossoms, uh, three Ghost Spells. These cards are really, really good this format. Funny enough, they are not good against combos. So if anybody ever decided to just pick back up Dragon Link or pick up Infernoble, I feel like that would be just like really, really funny because a lot of people are playing hand traps like these that are really not high impact against combos. So while these are good against the best decks, to be honest, anybody that catches that that kind of trend, seeing that the weaker hand traps are being played, like for example, if I wanted to just go in and play Pendulums, like, what are these cards really going to do to Pendulums? But they are really good right now. I also play Double Skullmeister and Double DD Crow. Instead of just playing, like, three Meister, I just wanted to kind of just play two and two. 
These are not once per turn, so these are arguably, you can arguably play these at three, because they're not once per turn. And these are kind of hand traps that really won't be dead for you, and they're also food for more. But I feel like Ash and Bell were better in hand because they had higher impact against the decks they're good against. And these are kind of like niche one-for-one -one trade offs. But they are dark attribute, which is super duper important. So like if you ever play against Zodiac Eldritch, um, at least you got yourself a dark, which is really important because Moork is a really good card to trade against Dryden. Being able to banish the Dryden, once Dryden's gone, like the headache is over, bro. Like you don't care about uh, Mega Clops because you can banish it with Moork. And you really don't care about the rest of their engine. So essentially, once you get um, the Dryden out the way, because like you're never going to let them summon Zeus if you play your deck correctly, because Moork can always banish at the start of battle phase. So, like, the only way they can out your Mork before they get a chance to summon Zeus is if they use Golden Lord to uh, send it to the grave. That's why, if you play against that deck, I honestly recommend you equip your emblem to your Mork so that it can't be targeted. And if it's properly summoned, and I do do that sometimes, it can't be destroyed by card effects twice or battle twice, and it can't be targeted. So, Golden Lord can't send it to the grave, and that basically means that they will never get access to Zeus because you should always activate Mork at the start of their battle phase. You don't want to play into talent. And you also don't want them to use an extender like Zodiac Barras to still get Zeus. So if you play it, if you play that match correctly, all you really need to do is banish Strident. And Mork is like the best card against that deck. It's not, Elise is not that good. Braun is not that good. Mork takes care of all the problems. Mork deals with uh, the the uh, Mega Clops. Mork banishes the Dryden. Mork prevents them from ever summoning Zeus. Mork also kills all of the Eldritch engine by banishing the Golden Lords. So you guys might be surprised. Some... Plunder Patrol strips are better than others depending on the matchup. But I think right now, Mork is really crazy because it's good against the decks that you have a really like difficult matchup against. That's another very valid reason for playing Dark Hand Traps so that you can get access to Mork. Even if you can't make, for example, IP Mascarena, but you have a Skullmeister. Because Zodiac Eldritch is like the most popular uh, Zodiac variant. A lot of people are just not playing here. And then I also played three Dark Rulers. Yes, all of these Hand Traps are really good against Drytrons. Every single one of these are live. All 10 of them, none of them are dead against that deck. But to be honest, that deck can play through all of them. So I really didn't want to, again, risk it for the Biscuit and one-for-one -one trade offs trying to prevent the board from happening when I could just Dark Rule and no more, clear the entire field, and set up as much interruptions as I possibly can. I mean, to be honest, this is why like I do kind of sometimes want to play Silent Angler, because whenever I Dark Rule them and break their board, the next best thing for me to do against Drytron is honestly to summon Abyss Dweller. Once I summon Abyss Dweller, I turn their next turn off and I can OTK them on the follow-up. Um, so I'm still kind of on the fence because I know Silent Angler is really not that great right now. But there will be times where you Dark Ruler a Drytron player and you really do wish that you had an extender like Angler so that you can make Abyss Dweller a lot easier. Granted, yes, this deck can make it without. It's just nice to have... More of like an insurance policy to make it more consistently. And then I main the Cyclones as well. You want back removal. Um, it's not just about like Conquistador or like the Eldritch cards. Um, being able to hit Shism sometimes is important. Because if they have Macabre, like Fleur de Lis, Punishment Shism, stuff like that. Like it's just way too much sometimes to play through. Uh, so like having the, the Cosmic for the Shism makes it a lot easier. Because it makes your extenders actually valuable. So granted, yes, Wind Up by herself... You can easily out her just by normally white or red beard passing so many more on draw phase and banishing her. Uh, but wind up plus friends is really hard. So this is another reason why like main decking cyclones is just really really good this format. And nobody's really on mystic mind, so like that's not a reason. And then I do still play call by. I call by because like Ash Blossom is kind of crazy against this deck. Droll can hurt to an extent. And um, outside of like Ash and Droll, like there's really no hand traps to just like end your turn. Uh, like, every single one of the ships add from deck to hand, that's why you can always chain after them. And that's why I've always been very adamant on main deck and call by. Even when it was at 3, I played 3 call by. Uh, so that's going to be the main deck. Uh, and moving forward to the extra deck, I did cut White or Well. Uh, because I wanted to have access to IP Mascarena because I feel like, again, I've been like kind of like reiterating how good Mork is this format. Because of the weaker matchups that I have. And um, to be honest... IP Masquerina was just too important for me. I needed to have access to a dark on command without relying on any RNG, just using my cards to make IP. And so I cut this card because I thought about it. I'm like, Drytron is not really going to give me a chance to use this. And even if I hit Vanity's Ruler, it's like 28 on 3,000 defense versus a Herald of Ultimatus does not solve all my problems. Virtual World just doesn't give me a chance. Like VFD stops this card. Uh, Zodiacs really summon their Dryden in defense. They're just way too smart. I'm just sitting here thinking, I'm like, dude, like, outside of, like, people summoning, like, Macabre, Borlode Savage, and, like, Dragoon, like, actual Omni Negators, like, combo decks, 
Like, this card's really not that great, to be honest. It's really not that great. It's not. Um, so I cut it. Like, it's a good card, but against the decks that I'm worried about, the decks that I have, like, um, in my subconscious, I'm like, okay, I'm really scared if I get paired up against those. I know this card just doesn't help me. So I cut it for a card that will help me, if that makes sense. Uh, for my plunders, I played two of each. I feel like proper resource management with this deck not only goes with um, making sure that you time your cards correctly, like being not being greedy and playing into cards that you know your deck's weak against. Like playing in an Ice Dragon's Prison just hurts a lot, right? Like playing into cards like Nibiru can hurt a lot. Playing into DD Crow, playing in, just playing into hand traps that you don't have to. That I feel like that goes coincides with resource management because if you're good with resource management you should also know that while managing your resources properly that you should not play into stuff that you don't have to play into like if you don't have a choice it's different but if you're just greedy or you're just playing over aggressively like you're just slapping cardboard on the field just because you want to flex or just because you're trying to overkill your opponent when you already have game like that's just really bad so part of proper resource management with this deck is properly summoning at least one of each of these the reason being is because your grind game gets extremely, and I mean extremely easier, when booty can just activate its effect to summon out of blue, activate its effect to summon out least. If these are not properly summoned, and you run out of them, now you run into a problem where booty has to not only put them back, because booty can recycle these, believe it or not, booty puts these back to your extra deck, but now you have to summon them out again. So you're burning two pieces of interaction to get out one form of interaction, uh, which could have been booty... Uh, tagging out to a ship, and then that extra resource that you needed uh, to normally summon out the ship, like when you would use Booty to put it back, now you could summon out a second ship. So now, for example, if you properly summon Lease, instead of not properly summoning it, Booty can summon Lease, and now your Redbeard can summon more. But if you need Lease first, and you didn't properly summon it, Booty will have to put it back, and then your Redbeard has to summon Lease, so now you have one interruption versus two, if that makes sense. So that's why I'm very adamant on telling people all the time, properly summon these cards, and every chance you get, use Blackbeard to target something that's not himself. Leave him on the field as long as you can, because he's a big advantage generator, uh, as well as Lease. Lease and Blackbeard are really like a huge part of your grind game, and they will definitely, they're contributing to your snowballing factor. Like every one of these, when you resolve them, do contribute to the snowballing factor, but these more so than the others, because these commit more critical mass, and also get you advantage in your hand. So it's hand and field presence consistent with these cards. The only time these contribute is if you're discarding cards like Whitebeard or putting Golden Hair in Grave with their effects. Um, but other than that, the rest of it's generic. We have All Mirage for the Golden Hair interaction. Golden Hair is really crazy in this deck. IP Masquerina. So essentially, um, you do not use links to make this. This is already known. But funny enough, Golden Hair with an extender, you can make All Mirage and put IP Masquerina under it. So now you have fire and also dark if you really needed that, um, which is just something that you should be mindful of. Because you never know. If you have enough extenders, you can put brawn and Morik up. And keep in mind in this deck, whenever you summon one ship, you'll typically be able to summon the rest because that's just how the deck operates. It has a huge snowballing factor. I also play Ashima. Um, I like Ashima because it does help to get into Dweller a lot faster. Like if I only had the, the body in hand... Um, for example, like, or if I just needed to commit to Critical Mass, what's really cool is this gives me Dweller, but also gives me another form of interaction to deal with back rolls, and also at the same time, this is the third plus about this card. It's a light attribute. So, instead of playing Union Carrier, I have a card that lets me drop a Dweller, deal with the back row, and give me light access for lease. So, I feel like moving forward, uh, these three links should not be cut from any opponent patrol list because they're really good. And if you test it for yourself, you will see how good these cards are. Outside of that, the XYZ are Dweller, Shark, and Totally Awesome. These are like the only rank fours I feel like are worth it in this deck. And then I still play Drag Act because this card's really, really broken right now. Like, it's so crazy. Uh, I miss being able to reveal Nibiru's off of this. I actually do that. It's funny. Uh, but that's going to be it for my Plunder Patrol deck profile for this format. Uh, the side deck could be anything. Uh, but I do recommend that you try and side deck going first. I've thought about cards like White Howling. Uh, if you control a water, you can actually interact with spells. Um, I've thought about Spiritual Art. Um, that I can go ahead and show you this card while I'm at it. I can just show you these cards because I do have them. Because like, I'm, I'm always like, my mind just kind of goes all over the place with my ideas. But these are cards that you could play because your deck is water-based. And because they're fiend-based, I've also thought of cards like Void Apocalypse and just generic fiend support. So because they're water and they're fiend, there's a lot more room for creativity. Um, and these are actually really good. They're not just spice, just to look spicy. Like, some people play cards just because it makes them look creative uh, for, like, the flex or for the clout or whatever. But I feel like these are actually problem-solving cards. Like, this one, I would play this one before I played this one. 
This one is really good. Like, Tribute White Beard is crazy. Tribute White Beard, look at your opponent's hand, put a red beard on the field. It's like almost like you just plus. Um, so this is something that you could side that going first. Because uh, it's never going to be dead. Like, if, if you didn't have any waters, that means you know plunder monsters. That means you're not playing. And you essentially play 16 plunders when you really think of it. Because the, the 4 skill spells and the 12 plunder names. Uh, this card's just really, really good. It's just like a tech card that I thought about for going first. Because I feel like hand information is crazy. Uh, after your opponent draws for turn, now you get to see their whole hand. It's pretty nuts. Especially if you play through a hand trap or two. But that's going to be it for my deck profile. Definitely hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm going to say my prayer and I will be out. Uh, so, our Father in heaven, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Lord Jesus Christ. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. And this is the Lord's prayer. I always say this because in the word Jesus said that this is how we ought to pray. So, I typically pray this prayer uh, for the channel. Uh, so, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Lord Jesus Christ. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Please give us this day our daily bread, Lord. And please forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, Father, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the glory, and the power forever. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua of Nazareth, we pray. Thank you, Father. Amen. All right. Deuces.